This video is sponsored by Woodworkers Guild of America. I picked up this mid-century walnut coffee table from Facebook Marketplace, I believe for 25 bucks. Now it's not in horrific shape, but there are definitely some issues. And the weirdest thing is that the underside of this is absolutely filthy in a way that I've never seen before. Now, last year we had some pretty major flooding in this province and a lot of it was muddy, dirty water. There is water damage on this and the underside is caked in this fine, muddy, gritty stuff. So I honestly feel like this might have been a victim in a flooding of some sort. Um, and you'll see what I mean when I start to clean it up. I'm using this center punch here to just mark a couple of spots on here so that I know exactly the orientation of this leg assembly when I go to put it back together once everything's done. That way, even after cleaning and sanding and sealing, I'll still be able to see those dots and know exactly which way this goes. Even here, taking the top off, you can see what the original bottom looked like. We've got two panels of veneer here with the seam down the middle, and then these water-stained, muddy areas. And you can see as I start cleaning this, it's just... I've never seen anything quite like this, and that's the only thing that I can think might have happened to this and why it was so cheap. This actually took several cleanings with crud cutter and then rinsing with water. I don't even know how many shop towels. But finally, it's at a point where I'm comfortable to move on, so I'm flipping this over, and now we're going to look at the top. So the finish here is obviously quite water-stained and a bit brittle, so I'm going to be scraping it. You can use a chemical stripper for something like this, and I do often, but on finishes that are really brittle, I honestly find this way faster. Plus, it's hard to get away from chemicals entirely when you're doing this sort of work, especially if you're going to be using a lacquer finish like I will be here. So I know it seems like kind of a moot point to talk about chemicals with stripping, but the less chemicals you can use is always the better. So talking for a minute about the construction of this piece. Now the entire leg assembly is all solid walnut, but this top panel is not. This is a veneer sandwich <laughs> with edge banding on the side and edge banding is just thin strips of veneer. When I'm scraping the top around edge banding, I always go very slowly, very gently, and on a little bit of an angle. Sometimes if you come down at a 90 degree angle, you'll hook just the lip of that edge banding and you can tear it. So gently at an angle is usually the best way to approach that. Now a lot of people hate this kind of furniture because inside of this veneer sandwich is usually pressed wood and it gives a nice flat, stable substrate that doesn't move with the weather. Now I mentioned that this was likely in some sort of a flood situation so you know everyone thinks pressed wood and water don't mix. How did this not just swell right up? I don't think this was submerged for very long or perhaps it was in a basement and as soon as it started flooding they went down and picked it up. I don't know. But there's also not big chunks of veneer missing here. The top is completely covered, the bottom is completely covered, everything is still intact. There's a few tiny chips along the corners and that is all. So if anything, this is kind of a testament to the fact that you can have a substrate like press wood and as long as it is enclosed and sealed properly with a good finish. It's not the garbage that a lot of people seem to think it is. And actually the majority of mid-century furniture is constructed this way. Right before I get into tackling that stain on the top, I wanna to go back to August of last year when I was talking about my transformation of my YouTube channel and my workspace. I started out in a closet, progressed to a corner in the basement, and then last year I was able to set up this really awesome desk. I love my little workroom, but it is just that, it is very little, and this is the reality. I am out of space. Now, I'm a very tidy person generally, so this is absolutely killing me. What I would like to do, because I do have some fairly useless areas, not to mention I'm sick of looking at these ugly foam tiles, I need to figure out how to get some more storage here. So I've got this closet. These are not the original doors, these just are temporarily there from another room, so I don't have to look at what is inside, which are a bunch of guitar cases and other random household things. 
The sponsor of today's video is Woodworkers Guild of America, and I obviously went straight there to see what I could learn about building cabinets. And the reason I want to do this, I would like to turn this currently fairly useless closet into a built-in custom storage solution with drawers and a spot for my printer so that I can find room for all the things I need to store now and also have a little room to grow as my business grows. I watched this first video about some special considerations to think about when you're designing a cabinet or storage space like I'm doing, and also watched a bunch of videos about the technical side of what I'm about to do. I've built drawers before and I have a pretty good idea of how I want to approach this, but because it's such a tight space, materials are expensive, I don't have a very big budget for this at all, I need to do this as economically as possible and get it right the first time. I'm trying to learn as much as I can before I even start. I have really been enjoying my time with Woodworkers Guild of America, watching all kinds of fantastic woodworking videos. It helps avoid some of the frustration you can get when you're trying to learn something new for the first time. If this sounds interesting to you, right now the first 1,000 of you to click the link in the description box below will get a full year of premium membership to Woodworkers Guild of America for only $1.49. You just can't beat that. <laughs> That office redo is coming up soon, but for now, let's get back to the task at hand. So the top was scraped and very lightly sanded with 180 grit. Now I need to deal with some of these stains. Now I don't know what this is. I don't know if it's paint or marker or some sort of ink. The first thing I'm going to try is some acetone. If it's nail polish or something like that, acetone should help with it, but it doesn't seem to be doing a darn thing. So for now, I'm just going to kind of quickly clean the top here with the rest of the acetone. You can get a good look at the natural color of the walnut as well and see any areas where there is some dark water staining. And on that far end there, that seems to be where the worst of it is. So I am going to be doing an oxalic acid treatment on this top. I don't think it's going to do much for that ink or marker stain, whatever that is, but on that far side where there's a little bit and you can kind of see these little dotted areas um, where those dark water stains are, this should take care of that and just even everything out. I'm thinking one treatment is probably going to be enough. The top is in remarkably good shape considering what I think it went through. And what's really, really odd is that there's not a lot of scratches on here. And then I got thinking about it. How do we remove scratches and dents from veneer and other wood furniture? We use water and what that does is it swells the wood fibers. So I'm wondering if this barely has any marks or compression scratches because it did get wet at some point. This is all very interesting to me. I've never dealt with this before. But I've done probably two dozen mid-century coffee tables over the last few years and all of them have a ton of scratches and marks. So this is really unusual. So this is after the oxalic treatment, rinsing and a very light sanding. And now I'm using some rubbing alcohol and that seems to be getting in this off. So I think this was some sort of alcohol based marker and happy to say I was able to get the majority of that off. So as would be expected with anything that had exposure to moisture, the majority of these screws and metal bits were rusty. So I'm putting them in a rust bath while I get to work on cleaning the base. Now there's still dirt coming off of this, but I think they did try their best to sort of wipe the visible parts down. Even the support blocks that help hold these legs to the framing there, those are also covered in this muddy dust. And yeah, this took a lot of time cleaning. And I actually had someone contact me the other day about how boring my cleaning segments are because they're too long, but I am not one for glossing over reality. So, you know, sometimes these pieces take a full day to clean. And because I have a lot of first timers and beginners watching my videos to learn, I don't want to create any disillusionment where that's concerned. These things take time and I am going to continue to show that in my videos. Now normally I would use a stripper on something like this but the finish was actually very thin and was able to sand right off. Again I just didn't see the point in pulling out a chemical stripper if I didn't have to. Now you can see I'm just doing the flat areas first. I will go in either by hand or with a sponge sanding pad to get those curved areas so that I don't mess up the profile. And you can see right there, that's exactly what's happening. I have a half inch, fairly high grit foam pad, which is just keeping that nice mid-century rounded profile. And you can see the beautiful walnut wood grain starting to come through. 
I did one final sanding there on the top and things are looking pretty good. This almost looks like a brand new top. It was really tempting to want to use Odie's oil on this. That was my go-to for sure. But I'm going to show you here, there's some variation in the grain and I'm not afraid of that. I like the different tones in the heartwood and sapwood, but there's areas like right here, for example, where the color difference is just, is too much. It's not going to look that nice just with a clear coat. These dark brown rich areas are the heartwood and then there's some areas of sapwood that are just so much lighter. Like you can see where these were two boards glued together and then formed and that's just going to stick out like a sore thumb. So I'm going to be using a lacquer finish with some toners to try to blend that all together. So I'm going to be starting off with some Mohawk Easy Vinyl Sealer. This stuff is toxic. You want to make sure you've got good ventilation, a respirator. And what this is going to do, this is just going to seal the wood grain kind of like a primer before I use any toners. Now there's an additional step that sometimes people will do with pieces like this and that is to use a grain filler. And it's almost like a thin putty sort of thing that you spread across the top and it fills in the grain so that you end up with a perfectly smooth finish at the end. You don't see those open pores of the walnut. I do like that in some situations. I'm not terribly worried about having that mirror finish on this tabletop so I'm skipping that part. But you don't want to just grab a can of lacquer and just go at it with the raw wood. It's better to use something like this first to kind of prime it. Because I'm going to be using toners as well, which is sort of like a tinted lacquer, this is going to provide a barrier between that tinted lacquer and the raw wood. Any of these Mohawk products, whether it's the Easy Vinyl Sealer, which I'm using here, the toners or the actual pre-catalyzed lacquer at the end, regardless, several thin coats is way better than one or two thick coats. It's going to be less prone to drips and running and it's going to adhere a lot better. So I actually did three light coats of the Easy Vinyl Sealer, basically to the point where I stopped seeing dull areas in the wood. And you can see here, this is my third and final coat of that primer. And then I'm going to take a gray pad and just kind of buff it off, make sure there's no little dust nibs that remain on the surface before I move on to the toner. So when you're trying to tone something, you want to find your darkest area, and that is this section right here. You can see it's a lot redder than the top, which is pretty typical because the tops usually fade in the sunlight over time. Walnut is a fader, whereas woods like cherry tend to darken over time. So we need to try to get all of these tones to match up with that. These areas here, <laughs> you can see the leg is quite brown while the rail there is quite red. I'm going to be using a medium brown walnut toner. Again, super, super light coats initially to slowly bring this up. I don't want this to be super, super dark and opaque, so I'm going to build this up slowly. And this is something that a lot of beginners struggle with initially. If you've never used a toner before, I wouldn't recommend starting out on a larger top like this. So this is after two light coats of the toner. You can see we're getting closer. It doesn't have to be exact, but it definitely has to be closer. This was that super pale part of the base here, and it is walnut too. It's just the sapwood, which is a lot lighter. This is called a fogging layer or a misting layer. You can see I'm quite far away from the piece, and this is allowing me to slowly build this up without getting big globs of it. Once that is completely dry and I have denibbed again <laughs> with a gray pad, now I'm ready to go in with my pre-catalyzed lacquer. And there's an overhead light there, which kind of makes this look weird in one spot. It's just the glare. And I'm going to do a total of six layers of this lacquer with a very light scuff in between with that gray pad. Or so I thought. Here's where things went wrong. What is going on here? Let me explain. <laughs> I had two cans with handles on them. I went to grab the lacquer for my next layer. 
I grab the toner instead and accidentally drop some more color here on this end after the top was nearly perfect. So I grabbed some lacquer thinner as fast as I could and tried to remove some of it. But what's going to happen, as you can probably guess, is that that is going to take all of the layers off. So I'm back down basically to the bare wood. There's an edge here because this is a film forming finish. So each layer you put on, it's going to build the level up higher and higher. So now I have to get this damaged area flat and level with the rest. So it's going to take some time to do this. I'm using a high grit here to try to feather this down and then I have to build up all over again. I have to go in with some vinyl sealer until that patched area is sealed. Then I have to go in with some toner and try to feather this in. This is not an easy thing to do at all <laughs> and I am so angry at myself. Well, despite my little hiccup <laughs> with grabbing the toner instead of the lacquer, I am happy with how this turned out. It's not perfect perfect like it would have been had I not made that mistake, but I did my best to try to fix that. So having a look back here at what I started with, you can see that this thing has been through the ringer. <laughs> Maybe not literally, but at least figuratively in terms of water damage. The staining on the top and the caked on mud on the bottom, I really think that's what happened to this piece and I'm glad that it survived. I don't know the maker of this. It's very similar to a Lane Rhythm table, but the top is different and I know for sure it's Canadian made because of the Robertson screws. As always, thank you so much for watching, enjoy the reveal, and I will see you next time.